Welcome to VMR, the 30 minute Thursday edition where we are half, we run half the time and we're also half the time late in order to open it up. Um, so it's a delight to have you all here. Um, it's also very special because um, because Malena is doing teaching points and Shama is scribing for if not their first time, certainly the first time that I am um, getting to see them do that. So I'm really, really excited and accompanied by um, my dear friend and VMR uh, teammate and currently on vacation, um, Charmin. Yeah, she does it on her birthday and on vacation. What more do you need to know about Charmin and VMR? Oh, how much I love VMR and how big of a nerd I am. I think yeah. are the two <laughs> undisputed facts about me. 100% can't argue with them now. Uh, the key question today is who's going to get to present to Charmin while she's on vacation? Um, so if anyone has a case, please, please, please volunteer to present it. We'd love, absolutely love to hear it. Um, I don't know if anyone can outdo Deborah's case yesterday, which was just crazy. So um, if you hadn't heard of it, you should definitely check out the whiteboard and ideally the YouTube video. Uh, oh really man, I'm so excited. I should go watch the YouTube video. I missed it. It really was. Um, was that a case that you saw yourself before? I couldn't, I, I was like listening from the emergency room. Um, so I couldn't quite follow the whole conversation or is it a kid? Tell me, tell us more about the background. Oh, you're in the library. Okay, all right. Maybe I'll hear it from you. Uh, I'll hear it from you one more time. All right, going once, going twice. Anyone with a case? Oh my gosh. All right, I'm a little scared. Uh, not, not because of Gurleen, because Gurleen is just a gem of human being, but every time that Gurleen has presented a case, I topple off my chair. Gurleen, you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. How are you? It's nice to be here. Gurleen, it's so good to see you, friend. Same here. It's so nice to be back. I can present a case if no one has one, and I, I will try my best to keep it short. I don't know if that if that, if that's in your control, my friend. Charmin and I can ramble away. So uh, if it runs late, it's definitely our fault, not yours. But yes, we would love to hear your case. Um, how? Uh, what rotation are you on with your intern year now? I'm currently on Jeopardy call, so I got called into oncology last week, and then right now I haven't got called in today or tomorrow yet. Fingers so. crossed. Fingers crossed <laughs> you get to hang out with us. All right. Well, uh, Charmin will uh, digest your first alphabet. We can't wait to hear it. Yeah, so this is a 62 year old woman who um, came in with a few months of poor appetite and unintentional weight loss and one week of jaundice. So she noticed that around four months ago, she was having decreased appetite, feeling very fatigued, and people around her noticed that she had lost a lot of muscle mass. And she said she probably lost around 10 pounds during this time period. Initially in the outpatient setting, her symptoms were attributed to worsening depression and anxiety, and she was started on acetalopram as well as um, clonazepam a couple of days prior to this presentation. For her anxiety, she also takes valerian root, which is a herbal supplement that she's used intermittently for many months and years. That's the first hour clock. Oh, what a start, early. And did I hear that patient is also has jaundice? Yeah, one week, one week of jaundice and like a few months of weight loss, fatigue, and poor appetite. All right. Um, thanks so much, uh, Gerlaine, as always. Uh, so we have a, a woman that is coming in with, with uh, symptoms that I'm very concerned about. Um, and I think when it comes about reduced appetite, unintentional weight loss, uh, for those, like our differentials can be quite broad, but John, this is the one that I'm going to build that differential around. Um, and when it comes to jaundice, you know, often we translate jaundice to hyperbilirubinemia. And just in the categories of hyperbilirubinemia, what we want to know if it's like mostly direct or um, indirect uh, conjugate or unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia with, uh, with like direct uh, make us a lot more worried about like what is going on with uh, the call pattern, the ducts, um, whether there's like external compressions, internal strictures um, as well. And then with indirect hyper anemia, then we tend to almost think about like, you know, heart failure, hemolysis, and, and many others. 
Well, to layer on um, that reduced appetite and unintentional weight loss, I think that we most con would be concerned about is like malignancy and kind of like more indolent infections that can present with uh, weight loss and hyper uh, uh, bilirubin anemia as well. I'm going to just uh, stop there and pass the mic to RG. And the mic will come back to you, my friend. I have nothing to add. That was like a very thorough analysis of the data we have. And I think it's... Um... Um, it's telling how powerful jaundice can be to give clarity about what's going on. And I think the tension will be that since there's such a discrepancy between the time courses of those two events, um, <clears throat> namely everything else and then the jaundice, is the jaundice a consequence of um, the a, a previous diagnosis or is it a continuum? And I, I think the, the um, sense is probably that um, the jaundice will give clarity on a previously unclear syndrome, but I think you might have to pause and say, is the jaundice a consequence of uh, the treatment of that um, presumed depression, so on and so forth. But the clarity is, I think, in the jaundice, and the question is, how does it fit with everything else? And for that, I'll give the mic to Gurleen to tell us more. Yeah, so in terms of past medical history, it has a history of hypertension, depression, anxiety, she was admitted once a couple of years ago for a rhabdo, um, and at that time it was resolved with an unclear trigger thought to be possibly medication related. Otherwise, for medications, she only takes metoprolol, the acetalopram, and the clonazepam that was recently started. She quit smoking 25 years ago, drinks alcohol occasionally. She says around a glass of wine once in a while, has not drank in the past three weeks. No recreational drug use. Her depression has been worse within the last year due to some difficult times in her family. The rise for family history, no history of malignancies, no other relevant family history. And I can also give um, the physical exam in this Tahlequah as well. So for her exam, her blood pressure is 103 over 64, heart rate 87, she's afebrile, Respiratory rate of 18, setting 96% on room air, has a BMI of 19. She's alert in terms of general exam, but frail and pathetic appearing. Her flare is icteric. Cardiovascular and uh, pulmonary exam are normal, no abnormalities. Her abdomen, she's, her abdomen is soft, non-tender, no hepatosplenomegaly. Extremities are well fused, no lower extremity edema. In terms of neuro exam, she's alert and oriented, she's conversant, in fact, attention, no asterixis. In her skin, she's jaundiced throughout, no palmar erythema, spider angiomas, or other skin changes, has some bruising visible in her lower legs. That's all I have for the second number five. Oh, Gurleen, the expert presenter that you are, thank you so much for um, outlining this so clearly. Um, maybe I can tackle the background information and, um, and leave the exam for Charmaine to reflect on. And I think, um, you know, the, and whenever a piece of background is uncertain, you're always tempted to say, is the rhabdomyolysis that she had before potentially, uh, since it wasn't explained, um, um, somehow related to the current symptom complex. And, you know, I struggle apart from thinking of medication overlaps, medication-induced rhabdo or toxin-induced rhabdo to think of anything else um, in an older adult. There are a number of genetic conditions that cause liver and muscle involvement. It's also very plausible that, um, that liver and muscle disease get confused because um, the enzymes that we attribute to liver disease come from muscle. But um, it's probably true, true, and unrelated. But the possibility may be that there's um, that both the liver and muscle are vulnerable to medication and toxin effects. Um, with one example uh, potentially causing both, um, namely statin-induced liver disease and statin-induced uh, muscle injury. Um, and I think um, I don't. I'm not, certainly not an expert in depression. I'm intrigued by the choice of a benzodiazepine to treat it. Um, certainly, benzodiazepines are options for the acute crises associated with depression, um, but often not favored for long-term therapy. So you, that you wanna use that to clarify um, uh, the arc of that diagnosis and whether it's still felt to be in the acute phase or there's something that you don't know. Um, and 
I think um, a history, a family history of liver disease can be helpful. There are a variety of either shared propensity for disease like autoimmune hepatitis or shared diseases like genetic diseases like Wilson's or hemochromatosis. So the, the background here is merely just, it's not as super informative and purely speculative. And we'll see what the foreground um, leaves for us to make more definitive connections to the background if there's anything at all. Um, beautiful, RG, as always. Um, so kind of thinking about the exam, again, you know, vital signs are stable. So that gives us time to think a little bit more about the, the exam itself. I think the, uh, one of the things that, you know, when people come to John, uh, John, this as we mentioned, like liver disease, something to um, to think about and that kind of stigmata of cirrhosis, she's not altered, which is good. Um, there's no um, like actual physical exam manifestations of cirrhosis. So thinking about hyperestrogenemia being the most specific sign uh, on exam. Um, and we, we don't see that. Um, the easy bruise, the bruise, is there any issues with a, coag a coagulation cascade, something to consider as someone who's always clumsy as has lower extremity bruises. It can't just be like, she's a bit clumsy, like I am. Uh, but um, I think in terms of like a liver, is, I'm not getting a striking picture of like someone who has decompensated cirrhosis. Um, in terms of like, if there, we can make any other um, diagnostic, uh, moving uh, diagnostic process forward, you know, no right upper quadrant tenderness per se, you know, I, I, given the tempo, we had like low concerns for like kind of a cholangitis type pictures to begin with, but again, like something to um, consider. And um, so I think still for me, I'm highly concerned about malignancy uh, given the tempo of the findings, you know, uh, if, especially if there's a uh, like a lymphadenopathy or um, or like pancreatic uh, cancer, um, uh, doing external compression on the biliary duct. That's something that, again, like we uh, exam might not be the most helpful. Uh, so I think like getting the labs and, you know, probably imaging, um, uh, it's kind of like the way um, I would go about uh, evaluating that. I think breakdown, um, looking at the liver chemistry, looking at the coagulations, getting your basic uh, labs and see what uh, shows up. Great. So for basic labs, her white blood cell count was 34, 84% neutrophils, 3% lymphs, 9% monos, hemoglobin 12.3, hematocrit 35, MCV 102, platelets 242, PT was 16.7, INR 1.5, sodium 120, potassium 4.3, chloride 80, bicarb 22, BUN 12, creatinine 0.7, AST 132, ALT 135, ALK FOSS 396, direct was 11.6, Total bilirubin 14.4, albumin 3.2, total protein 6.6, .6. normal calcium lipase and phosphorus, urine osmolality was 256, urine sodium less than 20, urine osmolality 315, ferritin 3000, ESR 44, CRP 16, and then acetaminophen level was less than assay, ethanol less than assay, salicylates negative, utox negative, and TSH and cortisol were also normal. And then I have a UA as well in this aliquot and some imaging. So UA showed two plus bilirubin and two plus urobilinogen, otherwise normal. And then I have a series of imaging tests. So, so for, um, she got a right upper quadrant ultrasound which showed cholelithiasis and biliary sludge, but no gallbladder wall thickening and negative mur Murphy's sign. It, it was not that it could be related to a reactive process due to the hepatic disease because there was a diffuse hyperechoic liver 
that was seen on the right upper quadrant ultrasound. And she also got a CT abdomen and pelvis, which showed a heterogeneously enhancing liver with moderate volume ascites and right pleural fusion and anasarca with some layering gallstones and mild wall thickening likely reactive. And then she also had an MRI, which showed similar um, findings, MRI abdomen of a fatty liver, heterogeneous hepatic enhancement, concerning for inflammation, and distended thick-walled gallbladder. And then during this time, she also became very hypoxic at dyspnea and exertion. She desatted and was requiring up to four liters of oxygen. And chest x-ray showed uh, bilateral pleural effusions. And then I just have, I, I think that's, that's enough for this alcohol. I, I'll, I will leave it. Woof, Darlene. All right. So we got a lot of information. So how about, um, I'll start walking through the labs and then I'll pass, um, pass, um, pass the mic to, um, RG uh, for all of his awesome thoughts. And, you know, whenever I get a lot of data, then I try to like make sense of it um, as I'm going through it. So, um, and uh, because there's like so many different abnormalities, let's just like walk through what is like jumping out the most and try to uh, see if it can tell us a story um, as we're trying to put this case together. So starting with his, uh, the CBC, like I think that jumps out um, to me the most is the white count of 34. So with um, uh, with a neutrophilic uh, predominance, we think mostly of uh, 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 mostly like infections, mostly stress response. Um, again, in someone who's like coming in with a jaundice, uh, coming in with um, who is a sick, then you know infections of the biliary tract is something to consider. We've got an imaging um, that are just going to talk more through as well, so that is less con um, concerning at this time. Um, the one thing that the platelets of two hundred, another, I'm um, just always want to make sure that thrombocytopenia is an early sign of cirrhosis. Not um, it's not here. Um, so uh, the thing that jumps out to me with that CBC is uh, the leukocytosis, whether it's infection a stress response to whatever is going on, or, um, you know, a, a lot of the times, uh, like solid malignancies can present with leukocytosis as neutrophilic predominance as well. Um, the thing that jumps out to me the most in this basic metabolic panel is a sodium of 120, so the hyponatremia. Um, and in terms of the hyponatremia, the first thing that I asked myself, like, hey, is this ADHD mediated or not? And a trick that I actually learned with uh, from um, RG is like kind of thinking about the relationship between the um, urine osm and the serum osms. And then here, the urine osm is uh, greater than the serum osms, meaning that the ADH is on. And that kind of thinks us uh, through that there's a problem with excretion with the uh, ADH being on then thinking about if this is mostly SIADH or de decreased uh, effective arterial. With the urine sodium that is low, uh, puts you in a category of thinking about uh, someone who's total volume up or down. Um, and the other thing about hyponatremia that I always like, think about is like, whenever you say hyponatremia, oftentimes is more than one reason um, that uh, somebody's hyponatremic. And um, so it tends to be multifactorial. So my first step is always thinking about like, what is the main driver? And those are the labs that I tend to trend um, because, uh, because again, like as some one aspect of it get better, uh, another reason for hyponatremia pops up and in someone who has like a really low appetite, low solute intake is something to also consider um, like going forward. In terms of the, um, uh, the pattern of injury that you see, ASC, LLT, uh, ALKFOS, and Billy, it, it's notable to me that the Billy and um, the ALKFOS is uh, more elevated uh, than the liver patterns of injury. So thinking about more clostatic pattern and thinking more a little bit about like infiltrative and intrahepatic ideologies. Um, I'm going to start there and uh, let RG layer on more. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, that's a brilliant analysis of the data you have. And I think um, <clears throat> the imaging here um, is so much more clarifying than how the, the speculative nature of the data and I think that's because, um, you know, whenever you know that somebody has direct hyperbilirubinemia, you want to know what their imaging shows. 
And um, the imaging here is interesting because there's no um, obvious um, overt extrahepatic disease. Now, what, what do we mean when we say extrahepatic disease? We're usually in this part of the schema um, where we say that it's outside or post-hepatic where um, um, there's disease of the common bile duct, the hepatic ducts or the gallbladder. And it's always a little bit tricky to know how to interpret these CTs because of course, Garlene didn't say this was normal. She told us that there's gallstones, sludge, and some thickening and wall thickening. But in order to explain a bilirubin of 14, you expect um, duct dilation. So you expect that whatever this disease is, is actually causing the backup pressure into the liver. And so you may say, well, we didn't get the best imaging studies. We didn't get an MRCP or an ERCP. So there's a small possibility that she might have disease unappreciated there because the sensitivity of those tests is not perfect. And something like a cholangiocarcinoma may result in stricture that is subtle and needs more advanced imaging. But if you take the imaging for its value on the surface, which is a pretty good 90% or so, the disease is inside the liver itself. And that's supported by the other imaging findings that we got, which is that the patient has, um, has diffuse echogenicity of the liver. And when the intrahepatic disease comes in three flavors, cherry cold, I'm just kidding, hepatocellular, primary doctor, infl I'm just making sure you're paying attention because uh, I'm, I'm getting a little sleepy. I just told the team that I had some chicken tikka masala before and oh my God, the GERD is the least of my problems now. It's like making me very comfortable and sleepy, but I'm, I'm trying to make, wake myself up and maybe you. Um, there's three kinds of um, liver diseases. There's diseases of the hepatocytes, which are hepatocellular, there are diseases of the ducts, which are um, uh, things like PBC, and there's diseases that live between them, infiltrative diseases. And here, the AST, LT aren't high enough for primary hepatocellular disease. And the presence of ascites supports the notion that there is more than just duct disease. The presence of ascites is very suggestive that there's something infiltrating the liver. Why? Whenever there's infiltrative disease, of the liver, the, the veins that course through the liver are compressed and you get ascites as a result. So you can pretty confidently, not although not perfectly, say that this patient has a, what is called non-serotic portal hypertension. And that non-serotic um, portal hypertension can be um, either prehepatic, intrahepatic, or post-hepatic. But by virtue of the patient's bilirubin, you know she, she has an intrahepatic um, non serotic portal hypertension. And those are further divided into ones that are systemic or localized. And by virtue of her pulmonary disease manifestations, you are pretty suspicious that she has um, uh, a systemic disease. And that systemic disease is either granulomatous disease or cancer or some very rare things. And in a patient who is in the US, the probability of a granulomatous infection is much lower than a 62 year old patient um, without exposure. And so this case really is terrifying at the beginning about the possibility of pancreatic cancer presenting with painless jaundice. But now we're much more worried about a diffuse infiltrating cancer, which could be HCC, um, but more likely is a metastatic solid cancer. And when you ask what is the most common metastatic solid cancer uh, in the US, it is lung cancer. Um, but in the absence of any overt lung findings, um, that suggest cancer on the CT that really presented, you're probably moving to the second most common, which is breast cancer. A breast cancer notably isn't seen on CT. So here, my priorities would be, how, how do we get to the bottom of this? And you start by doing the simplest things, which is the, the acidic fluid is right there. Let's tap it and see what that tells us. And it might luckily reveal the answer if there are malignant appearing cells. If not, um, then I think you probably have to be a little bit more invasive. All right, Gerlene, back to you. Yeah, I learned a lot from the discussion. Thanks, Charmaine and Ravi. So I have some more uh, labs. Um, so hepatitis panel was um, like normal. It was consistent with prior hepatitis infection, but no current hep, hep B infection. Um, otherwise, negative for hep E, D, A as well. Um, then we got also some antibodies. So she was negative for ANA, anti-smooth muscle antibody, anti-mitochondrial antibody, and LKM1. And then in terms of infectious studies, uh, negative for EBV, CMV, HSV, HIV, VZV, and T-spot was negative as well. Stereoplasmin was normal. Alpha-1 antitrypsin was normal. 
and then IgG and IgA were within range, and then IgM was 762. The upper range of normal on our test was 230. Serum free light chains showed normal capital lambda ratio, no monoclonal gammopathy on SPEP. CEA was normal. CA199 was 182. The upper limit is 35. The blood cultures were negative. Hematology was also consulted given the significant leukocytosis. And on review of the smear, there were no abnormal cells. Given that it was mostly a neutrophilic predominance of the lymphocytosis, they thought it's unlikely to be certain hemolymphies, but things that you would think about would be CML and CMML. So for that, they sent off a, a rapid heme panel, which basically looks at various mutations that would be found in those malignancies, and that was negative as well. And then um, during her, during this, like her home, um, two medications were held just due to concerns for drug-induced liver injury, though not typical for a clonazepam or citalopram, and it didn't really fit the time course. So the initial plan was for an endoscopic ultrasound and liver biopsy through that, but she, she became high risk because of her respiratory status, so it was, it was thought to be too high risk with intubation. Um, during this time, she also had an echo because of concerns, I think, of her um, volume status and other things, her respiratory status, which showed a normal ejection fraction um, and no intracardiac shunt, but possibly a small intrapulmonary shunt. And then the CTA showed no pulmonary embolism just because of her um, acute onset hypoxia that had happened in the hospital. During all of this time, her total bilirubin rose rapidly to 19 and her direct bilirubin was 17 at this time. And I think in terms of getting um, the acidic fluid, it was a hard pocket to tap because there wasn't there wasn't that much. So there was, um, in, in this aliquot, I don't have any more information about the acidic fluid. And this is the last bit of information before the final diagnosis. Sorry, the journey to the mute button is a long one sometimes. Um, really, this is uh, this is one very very tragic, but also very comprehensive workup. And I think um, if I were to summarize your abnormalities, I think one thing that stood out was a high IgM, elevated CEA, and then um, the um, the echo findings that suggest maybe a pulmonary shunt, and then of course the progression of her uh, of her cholestasis. Is that a fair summary of the data? Yep. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, all the other autoimmune infectious workup was negative. Um, and I think. I would take those negatives as at face value. The, um, um, yeah, I think I'm trying to reflect on whether um, the one the one thing I know that can be caught can be associated with an elevated IgM, which is primary biliary cholangitis or PBC, um, can explain the entirety of this picture, and um, it possibly can. PBC um, in most patients, it, PBC is a disease of um, middle-aged uh, women and classically presents with uh, cholestatic liver disease, but in its late phases can present with cirrhosis. Um, and I'm just struck by how hectic this presentation is. So um, it would prompt me uh, um, to test for PBC specific um, antibodies, which you may have mentioned the antimitochondrial antibody, but uh, I would look for it. There's a, other, a couple of other antibodies that have been recently described for PBC. Um, and that's where I'd interpret that data. I'm curious where Charmin's mind is going with the worsening and with all the other data that you've uh, provided. So I have no idea what's going on, um, which is a great place to be, which means we're gonna learn a lot more. Um, one, uh, yeah, I, I love that thought, RG. I think it's still like malignancy, like something infiltrative, like a lymphoma. It's just like how fast she's getting worse. Um, it's concerning. And I think in terms of like the echo finding, the pulmonary AVM, honestly, I'm not sure if that's a red herring or not. Um, and I think like in reality at this point, like just given how sick and complicated she is, this is just something that I would just ask home. Cause like, you know, with certain AVMs, um, you know, you can get hypoxemia, you can get um, high output heart failure. Is that something that is happening here? You know, she has like bilateral effusion, she has um, third spacing, she has liver injury, is heart here um, a, a 
of like is a cardiac etiology at play to further either complicating or being the driver of that? I don't know, uh, but I think like that is something that I would just ask ask expert to, uh, ask the expert to learn a little bit more because I've just never seen that happen with pulmonary AVMs, but something like with other AVMs that I've seen, um, and I think like against. Uh, uh, the you know the biopsy would have been helpful and unfortunately we're often here um, in the situation where we can't get that definitive diagnosis um, so I don't know exactly um, uh, other than just as you mentioned to think about other ideals you have liver failure and also heart failure uh, to think about um, in this patient I don't know RG any other thoughts yeah you know I think that there's something clearly hiding hiding and whether that's something that's very microscopic um, mm -hmm. that we um, can't, will never see on radiology or whether it's something that we typically see on radio, where we can see on radiology, but don't. And I think this is just, this, this is a reminder that the possibility of um, malignancies in the breast can hide on CT scan and mm -hmm. also um, malignancies in the GI lumen and the pelvis. So you might not see the ovarian primary on CT scan and need a uh, a transvaginal ultrasound. You might not see a gastric cancer and need an EGD, and you might not see um, breast cancer and need mammography. And I think it's also intriguing, um, having had more time to think about it now, is we're essentially saying that this patient progressed to hypoxemic respiratory failure mm -hmm. with a negative CTA, um, mm -hmm. which is a very rare differential diagnosis that invokes the possibility of something like a rapidly progressive um, uh, pulmonary hypertension process, which you wouldn't see that mm -hmm. also aligns well with pretty aggressive malignancies like breast or, mm -hmm. yeah. or gastric. So, and yeah. RG fits, uh, is it Meg syndrome, the one that has ascites and pleural effusions, right? right. Um, with ovarian um, pathologies. Right. And this is like way more aggressive than, I, I mean, we've had, I think, another case presented, but that's something that came to my mind too. Told you we should fumble when Gerlene's presenting. We'll see where we're at. <laughs> I yeah, love it. So, uh, in terms of um, what helped for the diagnosis, so she was able to undergo um, a liver biopsy through um, IR, interventional radiology. So that showed the liver biopsy showed um, hepatic parenchyma with architectural disarray. The lobules had moderate macrovascular steatosis and severe steatohepatitis with extensive hepatocellular ballooning, striking Mallory bodies, as well as neutrophilic infiltrate. Iron stains uh, show very minimal iron deposition. So basically um, the description of this liver biopsy per pathology was classic, um, classic findings for alcohol-related liver injury. Though sometimes in drug-induced liver injury, you can also have um, Mallory's myelin staining and also sometimes in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or PBC, but overall based on this pathology and kind of all the other markers, um, the final diagnosis was alcohol-related liver injury. So initially when I had gotten the history of her um, social history in terms of how much alcohol she drinks, she, her daughter was in the room. Um, so we, we went back to talk to her about her um, alcohol history. And she said that she at most has one to two glasses of wine five nights a week, but she always tries to check to make sure she's not drinking too much. And she said she only had alcohol once before to, in terms of um, an extensive amount to help her cope with her anxiety and depression. And her last drink had been a few weeks ago. So ultimately she was started on prednisolone given her high um, MADRI discriminant function score, which is a restratification tool to, for alcoholic hepatitis to um, guide further management with steroids. Unfortunately, she had a very um, tough course. She developed AKI, concern for hepatorenal versus pre-renal, and also had worsening hypoxemia requiring transfer to the ICU and intubation, um, had esophageal varices ultimately and rectal ulcer bleeding, and ultimately had multi-organ failure, um, and unfortunately um, passed away after she was made comfort care. Uh, I don't even know what to say. I think that's just so, um, ooh, it's so, so, so humbling. Um, I'm, I think it's not too surprising given the ultimate diagnosis of this patient with alcoholic hepatitis, the outcome that you just shared, which is always very sad and never something you want to end a case with. 
um, and I'm humbled. I think um, if, we, if we go back to the, what we were confident about, I think we were confident that based on the fact that this patient had jaundice and ascites that she had non serotic portal hypertension. And um, I put the schema away, but if you remember, there was local causes and systemic causes. And I think we made the assumption that it was systemic based on how sick the patient was, but I think there, 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 yeah, I'll pull it up just so you guys can review it. Um, there was a, a local cause um, um, sneaking up on, on us the whole time. And I think we don't tend to suspect the most common local cause, which is actually alcoholic hepatitis. Um, and I'll just leave these up here for you guys to review in a second. Um, that's, this is what we were confident about. You have jaundice and you have ascites. It's very, very rare to be outside the space. And um, I think given her pulmonary findings, it was hard not to assume that she had some systemic cause, but you know, in close scrutiny, that MCV was high. Um, and I think that may have been a tip off, but at the end of the day, the stigma associated with this disease means that you should always, always, always entertain the possibility that the patient has two problems. One, alcohol, alcohol use disorder, and two, um, society, social, society induced shame about alcohol use disorder. And the other problem, the second problem can get in the way of diagnosing the first one. Thoughts, Charmaine? Yeah, um, absolutely mind-blowing, Gurley. Thank you so much for uh, presenting that. A lot to reflect on. And I think one of the, I think this is such a powerful um, case for diagnostic reasoning because you have so much noise and signal. And like, I think I'll encourage you all to like um, go back and see all the abnormalities and then uh, with the, uh, with that final lens to see like where we went array with our like yeah we totally missed the MCV like yeah like um, neutrophilic glucocytosis hyponatremia all can see with alcap in fact alcoholic hepatitis can definitely cause that high of a leukocytosis which is all, this is something I tend to forget um, a lot as well and alcap is just such a gnarly and terrible um, disease and I think uh, yeah again just thinking about the societal factors uh, that affect patients. Uh, I'm like quite humbled by this. I love this case. Um, thank you, Gerlin, for presenting. Well, Lena, I don't know how you're gonna be able to uh, capture the, the epicness of this case, but if anyone's up for it, it's you. Take us home. Yes, okay, well. Uh, Gerlene, what an incredible case. We all went through quite the journey and uh, Robbie and Charmaine, that was such an amazing discussion. And I um, definitely have to go back and really kind of capture all the pearls, but I'll review kind of some of what we dis discussed. Uh, so we started with jaundice, which we talked about can be converted in our minds to hyperbilirubinemia. And we can break that down to direct versus indirect. And before we did that, Robbie shared a, an important question that we want to kind of pause and think about beforehand, which is, is the jaundice a consequence of a previous diagnosis or is this kind of a continuum of the disease process? And when we break down jaundice into direct versus indirect, direct you know, being conjugated, we can break that down into uh, intrahepatic and post-hepatic. For intrahepatic, you can think of, um, you can think of kind of the structures within the liver. So hepatocytes, ducts, infiltrative, um, you especially want to uh, prioritize an infiltrative process when you see that ascites is present. Um, but you can also break down intrahepatic as local versus systemic. And we talked about alcohol, hepatitis being the most common cause of uh, a, local, um, a local form of that. And then for post-hepatic, some of the examples we talked about were um, external compression of ducts, so such as um, pancreatic cancer. Um, indirect, we briefly talked about hemolysis and heart failure as some causes. Uh, we talked about when there's the presence of weight loss, we, it, especially with kind of this long tempo, um, well, I guess the unintentional weight loss, um, I guess a few weeks, so kind of subacute, you really want to uh, consider malignancy and not, not forget that. Uh, we briefly talked about the overlap between muscle and liver, and some of the things we talked about were statin-induced liver, liver disease. Uh, and important considerations that the enzymes we attribute to liver disease often come from the muscle. Um, when looking on a physical exam for liver dysfunctions, uh, a, a great pearl was that hyperestrogenism is the most specific sign for that. Um, and then I'll jump to her hyponatremia. I think Charmaine gave a really great, you know, brief overview is that it's often multifactorial, but you really want to break that down into ADH mediated or not. 
And in this case, because the urine osms were greater than the serum osms, we know that ADH was on, so you can prioritize causes like SIADH or decreased effective arterial blood volume. And um, I'll stop there, but what, what an incredible journey and thank you all. I really can't believe that was your first time. That was absolutely superb. <laughs> Love, good job. Thank you so much. Gerline, we missed you. Um, intern year is a, is a crazy one. It's great to see you uh, surviving and thriving and even bringing memorable cases to teach us. It really is a treat. And um, next time I'm just going to hide uh, when you present. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to hide. I'm going to thoroughly enjoy it. Um, so thank you for, thank you both for, for joining us and to Shema and Kirtan for co-scribing. It was a treat to watch your dynamic duo on the screen. Y'all are the best. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.